So I'm very happy to talk about elbow instability. I have uh, some disclosures. I'm a consultant with uh, AccuMed and I'm a co-designer of uh, an elbow immobilizer from Jake Design. Um, let me talk about elbow instability. We, we start out with the three pillars concept. And this was uh, based on a paper written by three experts, Jesse Jupiter, Graham King, uh, Sean O'Driscoll, instructional course lectures in 2001. Um, they identified the primary stabilized being the unhumeral joint, anterior band of the MCL, and the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. Secondary stabilizers were named as the radiohumeral joint, the flexopronator tendon, and the extensor tendons on the lateral side. And obviously the capsule surrounds this, uh, uh, this, uh, these stabilizers. Let's talk a little bit about the anatomy. Start with the capsule that's surrounding the elbow joint. It's very strong. It can contain up to about 30, 35 milliliters of fluid. And this is what happens when you, for example, fracture your radial head. It fills up very quickly and it's extremely painful because of all the nerve endings in the capsule. These are the three primary stabilizers that were identified by uh, Jesse Jupiter's paper, starting with the only humeral joint. And the only humeral joint is one of the most congruent joints in the human body. If you look at it a little bit more closely, you see that the medial side of the trochlea is much wider and more steep than the lateral side. And then if you look at the ulna, you see the same on the coronal process and the electron process. You see a big facet on the medial side. Now, this is why the ulnar humeral joint is the main stabilizer to various stress. The medial collateral ligament as such doesn't exist. It's a complex and the complex consists of the anterior band of the medial collateral ligament, which is the primary stabilizer to valgus stress, the posterior band, which is the most important stabilizer to posteromedial rotatory stresses, and then the transverse ligament, which per definition is not a ligament because it doesn't transverse the, um, the articulation. However, it probably plays a role in keeping the anterior band and the put together when they're being stressed. Same goes for lateral, lateral uh, collateral ligament. That's also a complex. The LUCL is a primary stabilizer to posterolateral rotatory stresses. We'll talk about that later on as well. Then there's a radial collateral ligament, which attaches to the humerus and then attaches to the annular ligament. It doesn't attach to the radius. And then there's the annular ligament, which stabilizes the proximal radial ulnar joint. Again, it does not attach to the radius. It attaches to the ulna, the same as all other three components. This is a relatively old study from 1983 by our um, uh, elbow pioneer, Dr. Mori and Dr. Ahn. Um, they showed that in extension, the articulation um, is responsible for 55% of their stress. So if you stress the elbow, the articulation will, will keep it in joint. Natural collateral ligament only 15% and the anterior capsule, which is completely uh, tight in extension, only 30%. So their stress on the humeral joint is a primary stabilizer. In flexion, the anterior capsule loses its strength and the LCL also loses some of its strength, which makes the articulation even more important. 80% will, uh, of resistance to various stress is from the articulation. In valgus, it's slightly different. In extension, the articulation, the medial collateral ligament, and we know now it's the anterior band and the anterior capsule sort of share the responsibility. In flexion, the articulation remains to be at around 35%, and the medial collateral ligament becomes more important. Anterior capsule, only 10%. So the radiocapitellar joint, only 35%, about one third, both in extension and flexion, and the MCL gains importance in flexion. So the secondary stabilizers are the radial head, the flexopronated group, and the extensor tendon, and potentially the anconeus. It doesn't mean they're not important. The secondary stabilizers, and they're still important, but they become even more important if, for example, like in this study from 91, the medial collateral ligament fails. So when the primary stabilizer fails, the radial head becomes the primary stabilizer. And that happens quite often in trauma. Now, when we talk about instability, there are multiple different ways to look at instability. For me, I think acute versus chronic and complex versus simple, that's probably the main, uh, those are probably the main things to look at. This is complex. Complex means there's a fracture dislocation, and that occurs in about 50% of patients. The treatment is very often surgical and is usually dictated by the, by the fracture. So in this case, electron plating, radial head, uh, maybe, um, maybe you can still do some screws or radial head prosthesis, one of the two, and then you look at the ligaments. So bones first, then the ligaments. 
simple dislocations, that's the other 50%, are dislocations with only soft tissue injury. So in this patient, for example, we don't see a clear fracture. Um, so this is this patient. In 92, Sean Driscoll published the circle of Hori, and the circle of Hori meant that the patient falls on the outstretched hand, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament ruptures, the lateral collateral ligament ruptures, we know now they both have to rupture together in order to get PLRI, then the anterior capsule and the posterior capsule simultaneously rupture, and then finally, in the third stage, the medial collateral ligament may rupture as well. However, it's not necessary to rupture the medial side in order to dislocate the elbow, so you can dislocate the elbow by only rupturing the lateral and collateral ligament and anterior and posterior capsules. This is a patient of ours, and this shows clearly how he dislocates his arm. So he falls on it, he rotates away, he saw his body rotate away, and he knows something is wrong, and people standing around him know something is wrong as well. And he dislocates his elbow at this point. And as you can see there, you see the radial head, and that's a very clear post-lateral rotatory dislocate or he didn't rupture his MCL only lateral side and obviously the capsule. So the diagnosis of an acute um, elbow dislocation is very easy. The patient diagnoses himself in this case. There's a clear deformity and there's a, there may be a history of dislocation. So some patients will, will self-reduce and will come to the ER without a dislocation. They'll say something happened. My elbow popped, it popped out, popped back in and the history of dislocation is very clear for the patients. And then when you take an x-ray and you don't see a fracture, we tend to treat them conservatively. So again, the diagnosis of acute dislocation, inspection, if there's an deformity, is quite clear. Uh, there's usually swelling, hematoma, and when you take the patient through a range of motion of flexion to extension, they'll experience some apprehension. You get radiographs before you start pulling on it because you never know if there's a fracture, and if it's a big fracture and you start pulling on the patient, you might dislocate the fracture even further. Um, if there's no minimum fracture, easier very quickly, so reduce the fracture in closed fashion, and then take them through range of motion. If the post-reduction radiographs are negative, we talk about a simple dislocation, and when in doubt, we take a CT, and it's not that uncommon that a small fragment of bone might be interposed in the, in the articulation, and that would definitely disturb the patient if we left it there. Conservative treatment in general leads to excellent results. Um, you get it through early motion, either with the sling or with the brace if you want to. Uh, start with an overhead protocol with the physio, which means that the patient is lying on his back and uh, starts moving the elbow against uh, gravity, which greatly reduces the elbow uh, joint and uh, fires up the, stabilize the dynamic stabilizers. That's a very low dislocation rate uh, with this uh, kind of treatment, and in general, patients do very well. However, Denise Eigendahl in 2000 and Anakwe in 2012 published on patients with simple dislocations that were reduced in a closed fashion, uh, patients that did not ask for me further medical treatment, and still 45% of the Nises group had medial laxity after 10, 20 years. Arthritis or degenerative changes were found in 40% when they compared it to the other elbow. So it's not that benign. Our NACRA's group was even worse. 10% still felt instabil unstable. So they still felt that their elbow would give way if they pushed in it, if they put force in it. 60%, so nearly two thirds still have pain. And in their series, the range of motion was predictive. So that's even worse. You have an unstable elbow that's stiff and painful. So there is a role for surgery. And we, it's, it's been postulated that about 2% of patients actually need surgery following a simple dislocation. So not a lot, but there is a role for them. What we do is we get the patients through range of motion. Like I said, they get reduced in the ER. Uh, our ER doctors take them through range of motion. unstable and they're candidates for surgery. Very important, I'm not putting any varus or valgus stress on it. I'm not putting any uh, post-relateral rotatory instability stresses on it and still they dislocate. Surgery also depends on the profession. Are they manual laborers? It depends on their sport. A keeper, yes. A soccer player, no. It depends on arm dominance. If it's a javelin thrower, but it's non-dominant arm, we probably would not operate. If it's a dominant arm, we probably would operate. And then when you do choose for surgery, you can do this either open or arthroscopically. This was a volleyball player. He went for a block 
and when he landed back on the ground, you know, the foot of his, uh, of his uh, opponent was still there and he fell and dislocated his elbow. You can see he's grossly unstable on the medial side and very clearly unstable on the lateral side. This is the pivot shift test and you see how this motion. The motion is supination, axial compression, and a little bit of valgus stress. We make a relatively small lateral incision anterior to the lateral collateral ligament complex, we go in, which is the EDC split or Kaplan interval maybe if you, if you go a little bit more anterior. And this is what we see. We see a stripped lateral epicondyle. So that's where the LCL complex used to be. And this is the LCL complex that's usually retracted quite a bit. So you look under the um, extensor tendons and you find the stump of the LCL complex. That's important. Don't just suture the extensor tendons back, but find that stump. Not always necessary to release it from the extensor tendons. In this case, it was stripped, so nature had done it for us. Um, so we reduce it, fix the ligament back to the lateral epicondyle, together with the extensor tendons, there we go, and then you get a strong repair. If you want to be even stronger, you go vest over pants, so you grab the anterior extensors and you suture them just over the flexor, over the uh, posterior part of the extensor tendons to create a very thick, layer of biological tissue that can heal and stabilize the elbow. On the inside, it's a little bit more tricky, obviously, because we have the ulnar nerve there that you don't want to uh, disturb um, incision on the anterior band, because that's usually what's ruptured. We do an over the top uh, approach through the flexor uh, pronator group. So just inside, the, um, inside the, the tendon itself, then you have the muscle belly that you can just scrape off the capsule. This is the tear in the capsule and the avulsion from the medial epicondyle. Notice that we didn't look at the nerve. So the nerve is still in its bed. We don't touch the nerve, but you can be sure that we know where the nerve is at all times. So I know exactly where the nerve is. If I'm in doubt, because sometimes there's a lot of swelling, maybe a lot of blood, maybe the tendons are torn as well. If you're in doubt, look for the nerve and see the nerve when you're doing all this. Um, you can place the anchor in the medial epicondyle. It's at the base of the epicondyle, as you know, not at the top of the epicondyle. You place it at the medial epicondyle. And then when you start suturing, this is the important moment when you need to know where the nerve is, because if you uh, put your needle through the suture, uh, through the nerve, or if you put the suture over the nerve and strangulate the nerve, that's probably even worse. So you tighten this suture. Um, the, the, at this point, the capsule is closed and the anterior band of the medial collateral ligament complex is closed as well. And then we fix the flexor pronates with a split as well. Is there a role for arthroscopy? Yes, there definitely is a role for arthroscopy. You can evaluate stability if you, uh, if you feel that you're unsecure. Um, you can treat associated lesions. Like in this case, there was a radial head fracture together with a interporous cap uh, fracture uh, capital cartilage as you can see here, which is blocking rotation. Oh, that's an excellent indication for arthroscopy. Coronoid fractures, if, they're not, if they don't need a plate and you can fix them with a screw or with pins, coronoid fractures can be treated arthroscopically quite easily. And then radial head fractures. Uh, in my hands, hands, if it's displaced, I prefer still to do a mini open incision, um, but you can do this arthroscopically as well. And then the lateral collateral ligament, you can definitely repair this acutely without a lot of problems. And this is how we, how we do this. This is a patient with an elbow dislocation. Unfortunately for this patient, highly unstable. You see there's a lack of cartilage at the back of the capitellum. And unfortunately, again, a big chunk of cartilage has gone on the medial trochlea. And that's, this is where we, we see the naked um, medial epicondyle. So also the medial collateral ligament was also stripped. This is a stump of the LCL complex. Um, notice that I keep talking about LCL complex, not about the UCL or just the RCL, they, they have a, um, an insertion together. They need to fix them together because they're ruptured together. So 19 gauge needle, a PDS suture through it. It's nice and thick. That's why we use PDS. It's easy to uh, shuttle through this needle. Um, grab two of them. They exit uh, the, the body out of the soft spot portal. And then we place an anchor through a small stab incision. So you saw my blade. Um, this is a guide to, uh, to drill the anchor. Make sure that you know, use a nice and rigid guide. We use all suture anchors, which you use whatever you need, of course, or whatever you feel comfortable with. Put it in, test the anchor, make sure that it's tight. 
Then we grab the both limbs of the anchor, exit through the um, soft spot portal again, attach them to the PDS, and the PDS is now used to shuttle this through the stump of the LCL complex. So there you go, you see, the, you see the, uh, the suture at the bottom, dislocate the elbow when the sutures are not uh, tightened, and then we reduce the LCL complex and you see how this stabilizes the elbow. I always remove the scope before I suture the, um, the repair, before I tighten the repair, because I still feel that as long as the scope is in, there will be some laxity from the posterior lateral um, a capsule, and I want this to be as tight as possible. So test it during uh, under direct vision. However, remove the scope and then fix it. So in conclusion, simple dislocations they're not always benign. Um, conservative versus surgery depends on patient selection and obviously on the instability pattern. Surgery we do perform in truly unstable patients. Spontaneous dislocations with before thirty degrees of extension in my hands get surgery and. Over And chronic instability, that's a slightly different uh, topic. This patient is performing a, a pivot shift test without knowing it. Look how he adds some valgus stress. He puts his hand on the table, so he has his compression and his hands in supination when he's dislocating his elbow. Again, Sean O'Driscoll in 92 um, showed us that pivot shift or that the PLRI exists in different phases or different gradations. Zero, it's reduced during pivot shift. One, the slight subluxation, so you see how the radial head um, exits the radial capitella joint and how, the, how there's an opening on the medial side of the, oh, sorry, on the lateral side of the ulna. That's important, so the forearm is intact. It's the entire forearm that's dislocating, not just the radial head, it's the entire forearm that's dislocating away from the uh, humerus. Grade two is dislocated, but not quite there. It's perched on the, the corner, it's perched on the um, trochlea. And grade three is completely dislocated. Again, uh, this uh, debate between open or arthroscopic surgery, we do perform arthroscopic stabilizations in grade one and sometimes grade two uh, uh, post-relateral rotatory instability patients and grade two or grade three, depending on the patient and depending on the longevity of the instability, uh, get an open surgery. This is a pivot shift test um, that shows a grade one instability pattern. You see that there is some subluxation on the radial head, but it doesn't uh, completely disappear. And this too, in our hands, is, is a great candidate for an arthroscopic uh, imbrication of the LCL complex. This patient had an injury to the uh, LCL complex six months ago. Again, we're watching, we're, the camera is in the uh, post lateral gutter. Um, 19 gauge needle, more or less the same from the insertion of the LCL complex into the radiolateral gutter. We do the same from the insertion. So this is now this now exits the soft spot portal as you see here. We grab it, gets out of the uh, soft spot portal. We leave it there. We remove the needle, and then a second needle from the LCL insertion, but a little bit more distal, a little bit more medial. So we, we put the needle on the bone, so on the on the subcutaneous border of the ulna, and we go into the radial humeral gutter again. Shallow the suture, pull it out of the soft spot. And now we have two halves of our repair and reconstruction. Tie those two together. Pull on one side, it doesn't matter if you pull distal or, or proximal. Make sure that you have one strand of PDS now in the joint. So there's one strand of PDS in the joint exiting from the insertion to the or And tie this halfway, and then we pull this through. So we have two strands into the joint. There you go, we have the double suture there on the inside of the capsule in the direction of the LCL complex. So the LCL, UCL uh, in this case. We then shuttle them subcutaneously, and that's the biggest disadvantage of this, uh, of this technique. 
because there's a big knot of PDS under the skin, which uh, often irritates the patient. However, it's as you know, it's resolvable. So it goes away, but it can take a couple of months of, uh, of this, these patients not feeling very happy with the knot. And there you can see the stabilizing effect. So we test the stabilizing effect the same as what we do acutely, test it. If we feel comfortable, we remove the, the scope, as you can see here, and then we tie these two to decrease the, the width of the knot as well. Postal protocol is the same as what we do with our uh, acute dislocations, immobilization 24 hours. We use a progressive brace. That means that we use a brace that uh, uh, allows flexion completely and allows extension to 60 degrees for the first two weeks, 30 degrees for the second two weeks, and then um, uh, zero degrees for the last two weeks. Patients are allowed to uh, perform immediate active and passive mobilization and strengthening at six weeks. Now, what do we do with severe chronic PLRI? In severe chronic PLRI, we feel that the anatomy or the biology is not sufficient to stabilize this elbow. So what we do there is we add some uh, biological tissue. This is a patient with severe chronic PLRI. You see there's not a lot of tissue on the lateral side that we can imbricate or that we can fix. So we need to add some tissue there. So in this case, we feel that there are arthroscopic techniques probably not sufficient to, uh, to fix this elbow. Lateral incision, slightly different to uh, what we use acutely because we go through coccus interval in this case. So we, we uh, aim our incision from the lateral condyle uh, to the posterior side of the radial head and the ulna. You see how there's a lot of fluid in the joint, origin and insertion of the LUCL, a urologic guide pin unicortically in the, in the ulna unicortically because we don't want to touch the ulnar nerve obviously on the other side. Add a little uh, bone button that we flip in the intermodulary space. We tighten the loop. We, we use allograft, but obviously you can use uh, uh, palmaris longus. You can use uh, um, part of the triceps. You can use uh, hamstring graft, whatever you feel comfortable with. So there's lateral epicondyle. Um, isometric point is about that center of the lateral epicondyle. We over drill it with 4.5 cannulated drill and we go through all the way through to the second cortex in, uh, in this case as well. Then we over drill it again, uh, only the first cortex to create a little tunnel with the six millimeter drill. That button goes through the tunnel again. We flip it on the posterior side of the, of the humerus. Obviously very acceptable to use bone tunnels as well. Um, one of the reasons we use this uh, button is what you see now. We're able to um, really tighten that, uh, that suture and really tighten that graft. Because we have a lot of graft remaining, we just flip it back. Biological tissue that we added. We then close a uh, caucus interval, close it over the graft, and this can now all um, can all now stabilize the joint. Post op X-ray, uh, like I said, very acceptable to use a bone tunnel here. Very acceptable to use a bone tunnel there, or maybe a Y or a docking technique, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, I prefer this technique, not necessarily in the ulna. We we often do bone tunnels here but I do prefer it in the humerus. So we don't need to open the back of the humerus and go uh, all the way through to the back. So it limits our uh, dissection. Immobilize the elbow for 24 hours. Again, progressive brace, exactly the same as before um, and strengthening in about six weeks. The results are good in 85%, the stable and subjectively satisfied, no a little laxity at clinical exam and has good improvement in pain scores. 75% uh, pre op 7 to 140, post op 6 to 136, so very acceptable uh, range of motion. And obviously, the results depend on the pre op status. If there's a lot of uh, degenerative, uh, de if there are a lot of degenerative changes in the elbow, they won't disappear after stabilizing it. So you're a little late. This is the medial side of the elbow. 
You see how that's chronic medial instability in, on this arthroscopy. So the humerus at the top, the ulna at the bottom, it's not supposed to open at all with valgus stress, maybe one millimeter, but definitely not one centimeter like here, like we see here. So this means that um, the elbow is grossly unstable on the medial side, both the anterior band and the posterior band of the medial collateral ligament are insufficient. This was described first in 1946 uh, already by Varys. He uh, said that throwing athletes were susceptible to this kind, uh, kind of injury. And we know now that 97%, so almost 100% of all elbow problems will be medial uh, collateral ligament insufficiency. In Belgium, we don't see that many baseball players. We do see tennis players, javelin, handball, gymnasts, even weightlifters with similar problems and a medial collateral ligament insufficiency and, and pain and opening. We know from acute medial collateral ligament injury in uh, athletes that conservative treatment in pitches leads to only 42% of return to play after six months. And that's probably not good enough in professional athletes. So we tend to perform surgery if they have a complete rupture. This is patients with a complete rupture where surgery is probably the preferred uh, way to go. Acute MCL in non-athletes, 93% good to excellent at five years in different series. Um, so they do very well if you treat them. However, unfortunately in throwers, it's usually acute on chronic. So as when the MCL ruptures, it's not because of that one throw, it's because of the degenerative changes in the... Uh, simply fix it. That is probably not enough in this, uh, in this group. This is a drawing from Mark Safram in 2003, uh, valgus extension overload syndrome. And this is an important drawing. What they saw is you have valgus load, because of valgus load, you get a medial strain on the MCL in this case. And we know that the MCL can fill at only 35 Newton meters of, of stress. So 35 Newton meters is not a lot. If you know that medial stress is of 64, so almost double the stress with just a single throw from a professional pitcher. So if a, if a pitcher throws, they get double the stress on the elbow that's needed to, uh, to uh, rupture the MCL complex. That's a lateral compression of 500 newtons and speed of 3000 degrees per second. So that's huge. So they need muscular compensation because if you allow uh, that kind of force to go onto your MCL complex, you immediately throw. So muscular compensation in professional athletes is extremely important. If it fails, then you get an MCL stretch or even a rupture, but in this case, a valgus extension overload is very slow. So you get an MCL stretch, you get radio ca capital compression, know that it's 500 Newtons in, this, in these patients. So that's uh, 50 kilos every time they throw radio capital compression. And if you follow through with that, if you don't do anything about it, post-remedial osteophytes and radio capital osteoarthritis. Most patients will not ask us for painkillers and non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, but by the time they got to, get to us, they've already had this for a longer time because they don't want to admit they're injured. So they just continue playing. They may get some injections, uh, not from, from me, but maybe from other uh, sports uh, physicians, um, homeopathic, Botox, blood, cortisone, PRP, uh, stem cells, lots of injections have been tried. So far, not necessarily better. For me, the main treatment is um, prevention. And prevention means that you have to work with the dynamic stabilizers, strengthening, kinetic chain exercises, the back, the shoulder, don't forget about them. And in tennis players, for example, do not forget about endurance. This is only one set. And almost every time he's hitting his, his ball sub-maximally, almost maximally, definitely. And this is every time there's a force on his MCL. This is two years after his MCL repair or reconstruction when he's playing for Belgium in the Davis Cup. So when do we do surgery? Failure of conservative treatment, however long it takes, I guess. So we're trying to avoid surgery in these players and we try to, uh, to make them healthy again with conservative treatment. So definitely, definitely physio, exercise, strength training, look at the technique, look at in, 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 uh, uh, in tennis players, look at, their, uh, look at their tennis racket, look at their grip, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we work together with their trainers Um, you need all this to avoid surgery if you can. Unfortunately, most of professional athletes already have a good basics. And even more unfortunate is the time pressure, timing in the season and the time out of play. So maybe 
you don't want to perform surgery now, maybe you want to postpone in a couple of months, or maybe you do want to do it tomorrow or yesterday if, if possible, because patients will be out of play for quite a long time. And we know they'll be out of play for maybe six months or up to a year, uh, even after MCR reconstruction. Again, is there a role for arthroscopy? Uh, diagnosis for sure. Uh, therapeutic, yes. Synovectomy, loose bodies, osteochondritis, uh, posterior osteophytes you can remove um, and you can maybe reconstruct the uh, medial collateral ligament arthroscopically, but I've not done that. And I, I think the risk of doing this is a little bit too high with the ulnar nerve being right there. So I prefer to do this uh, open instead of arthroscopically. This is a patient with opens up, I can just put my scope between the humerus and the ulna. So this is not normal. If it's more than one centimeter, everything is ruptured. So the anterior band and posterior band are insufficient. This is called drive-through sign. So we're at the lateral side, you saw the radial head going by and we're just looking through to the medial side, the same patient. This is a different patient, again, a drive-through sign. There's the radial head, there's the ulna. Uh, luckily for the patient, very good cartilage. Unfortunately for the patient, complete insufficiency of the MCL complex. This, is only, this patient is only 14 years old. He had an OCD with the loose body, as you can see there, um, but he already has some, some uh, signs of valgus extension overload syndrome. See the osteophytes in the um, lacrimal fossa there impinging on the lacrimal itself. So in extension, they're impinging. That's obviously very bad prognosis for this patient in a, in a 14 year old athlete. Not a bad prognosis with regards to the elbow. The elbow will do fine, but with regards to a potential professional career, that's not good news. Like I said, I prefer to do this surgery open instead of uh, arthroscopically. Uh, although it is possible, you can, it, it has been shown to be, uh, to be, uh, to be some, pay, some uh, surgeons are able to do this safely, at least on a cadaver, as far as I know, it's not been done on a, on a, on a patient yet, but uh, I would definitely uh, at this point still say that open surgery and no arthroscopic reconstructions for MCL. So patient with the arm, the arm table, you see the ulnar nerve there. Again, the same thing. I know at all times where the ulnar nerve is, although we don't see the ulnar nerve, but we know where it is. There's still some uh, medial collateral ligament left, but you see some opening. You see it's not ruptured, but this collateral ligament is insufficient in the baseball picture. Um, there's not a lot of stress on it, and you see how it opens up. If I can, I prefer to leave the, um, the native uh, ligament uh, intact. Um, because it helps me, first of all, helps me identify where I need to be with my tunnels, but it also helps me with my repair later on, and my graft will not scrape too much on the uh, on the underlying bone. Create a little tunnel and a Y. So the, this this is more or less the um, the classical uh, Tommy John procedure. Uh, obviously different with the um, Tommy when Tommy John had a surgery. Um, uh, they looked at the ulnar nerve, they transposed the, ul transposed the ulnar nerve. We know now when we use the over the top um, approach by Hodgkiss, we know that we don't need to see the ulnar nerve and this actually decreased uh, complications of ulnar nerve neuropraxia and neuro ulnar nerve uh, problems. You measure the graft because you don't want to be want it to be too long. If it's too long, it's not going to be stable. If it's too short, the graft's not going to end up in the tunnel. So you measure how long the graft needs to be, and then you cut it. It's relatively scary because uh, uh, that's uh, something you need to do perfect. Um, you saw that I sutured the limbs, sutured the flexor split that we did, and uh, the surgery is finished. In this paper by uh, Joaquin Sanchez Sotelo, 85% was satisfied, more or less the same as on the lateral side. No or little laxity post-op, very good pain relief and very high return to play. So to conclude, elbow stay instability, acute. Most patients will do fine or, or even very well with conservative treatment. Um, if you do do surgery, we tend to repair the MCL and not necessarily the MCL. So what we do is we go to the lateral side, we repair the, MCL, the, the lateral collateral ligament complex. We take them through range of motion again. We see if they still dislocate. And then we sort of treat them like a simple dislocation. So we let the MCL scar down. If they still dislocate, we go for the MCL. If there are patients like the goalkeeper or like a baseball player that need the MCL for their sports or their, or their profession, then obviously we prepare them. I don't necessarily repair all, all of them. 
In chronic cases, it's slightly different. Posterior lateral rotatory instability, uh, grade one, grade two, we uh, perform an arthroscopic imbrication. So we use all the soft tissue that's there and we imbricate it to, uh, to offer stability. Or we do an open reconstruction where we add, in our case, we add an allograft. Medial collateral ligament insufficiency, chronic medial collateral lig ligament insufficiency, we do an open reconstruction. We do not offer our, surgeon, uh, our patients uh, any arthroscopic uh, options. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Roger, for the fantastic presentation. And uh, I think it is, uh, it's well received by the audience. Uh, a couple of questions have come up. One of them is, uh, so do you approach surgically for a medial dislocation of the elbow, acute postromedial dislocation of the elbow? Do you treat it conservatively or do you think the surgical indication is there? That's a good question. And there's, there's definitely uh, a surgical indication in some patients. So we, in uh, postromedial instability, we, we get a CT scan. And uh, very often they will have an evulsion of the anterior band of the MCL from the ulna. So it's very important to get a CT scan because the X-ray may look nearly normal or may look almost normal. There might be a slight sign of, of promise. And then if you get a CT, you see a medial um, a facet fracture of the coronoid process and they need surgery because uh, the hinge will be off. They, they, they won't re-dislocate, but they will have subtle instability and they will get degenerative very quickly shown by, uh, by Sean O'Driscoll. Uh, another reason to do medial um, repair may be if the flexor tendons are ruptured as well. There's there's quite a lot of literature now coming up on MRIs. We don't, we're not a big fan of MRIs uh, uh, following acute dislocation, but if you're afraid of the medial instability in these patients, an MRI is a good idea. You get them as soon as you can. And um, there's some literature coming up that if the flexor pronator group is ruptured as well, so not just the MCL complex, but also the flexor pronator group, that they may need surgery or may do may do worse with um, conservative treatment. Unfortunately, and that's the, the negative side of those, uh, of those papers, it's not been proven that they do better with surgery. So we're postulating, we're still at a phase where we're postulating, um, are we gonna perform surgery in this patient, yes or no? Because we know that most patients will do very well. You know, 20 years ago, we didn't know about all these instability patterns and everyone was treated, then nearly everyone was treated conservatively and, they, and the, major, the majority do very well. We're now looking to see if we can improve on this and we need some more literature, whether it's better to, to do surgery, yes or no. I so, think it's mostly on a case by case basis. You do yeah, for sure. CT, MR, and then you make a decision. But can we make a statement, say, for example, if you see a medial dislocation of the elbow, because normally we don't get a CT or an MRI for the simple elbow dislocation. So the moment you see a medial elbow dislocation, can we say that it needs further imaging in the form of CT or MRI? Yes, my threshold for CT scan would be very, very low. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, in two thoughts about the soft tissue injury and the MRI. Um, like I said, we don't tend to do MRIs following a simple dislocation at all, um, because you will always see something ruptured, I guess. Uh, but a CT scan, my threshold for a CT scan is very, very low, because the, the x-ray can be very deceiving. Thank you for that. The other question is, what kind of instability pattern do you see more common athletes? Is it the lateral side or the medial side? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, uh, Sean O'Driscoll says that the that it's nearly 100% on the lateral side. There's a paper from Germany that looked at YouTube videos, and they uh, uh, when I th first saw the abstract, I thought, oh, that's that's a strange idea. But what they did was they looked at 50 or more. Um, people that dislocated their elbow. And luckily we have people that dislocate them and then post them on YouTube. And they saw that in many of them, the medial collateral ligament would rupture first. Obviously it's difficult to tell because we don't have uh, uh, CTs or MRIs post up or post dislocation, but they postulated that probably the medial side would rupture first and then continue to the lateral side. Well, it's an important discussion and a discussion that's probably not been, um, you know, we don't know the proof yet. But we do know that if you have lateral instability, they don't heal that well. Postolateral instability doesn't heal very well. Medial-sided instability heals quite well. You know, although Denise's paper showed 40% still some laxity on the medial side, but bear in mind that those patients didn't need any medical attention. So they didn't come to the doctor because of elbow pain. The doctor looked at them because they had a dislocation 20 years ago. 
So medial sided instability you can leave, I think. Lateral sided instability, um, the threshold for surgery is a little bit lower, although, like I said, most will still be conservative, but they don't heal very well. So let's keep it so in can the Can you make a statement that uh, lateral side instability is more symptomatic than medial side? Yes. That's what I just wanted to say that the, it's probably symptomatic instability is more common on the lateral side. And that is why we tend to operate less on the medial side. Yeah, well, also because when you operate on the medial side, um, there's more complications, the nerve is there, stiffness is much more prominent. If you, As soon as you operate on the medial side, patients are prone to stiffness and have a long rehab uh, uh, in front of them. Whereas if you just go lateral, it seems they seem to regain their motion very, very quickly. And with respect to reconstruction, what do you think is the difference between the lateral side and the medial side, the tendon? The a graph that you use in the isometric point. Anything, any differences between lateral and medial? Not a lot. No, not a lot of difference in lateral and medial. The, the reason why I um, I showed different two different techniques was first of all to show you that there are different techniques to use. Um, and I had a problem with the button one time. So uh, on the on the lateral side, I've never had any problems with the button. On the medial side, I use it in a javelin thrower and. Uh, I've, I think two or three years post op, she was throwing again and she was doing very well but she fractured to the, through the tunnel. So I pulled the graft in quite deep. So there was a deep tunnel that obviously doesn't heal because the graft is there and she fractured through the tunnel. So now I tend to make a smaller tunnel uh, like you saw on a baseball player and make a smaller tunnel so that the, the, the posterior side of the, of the um, medial column stays intact because I think I underestimated the stresses on the elbow. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Roger. I think that's all the questions that we have and it was such an engaging lecture. I think everyone has benefited a lot. Thank you so much for being with us and we really look forward for more from your side. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.